The day is January 17, 1968. A team of North Korean commandos have just cut a hole in the fence along the demilitarized zone on the 30th parallel. They are on a mission to assassinate the South Korean president Park Chung-hee. Between them and their target lie 35 miles of treacherous, mountainous terrain and they are on hostile territory. If they get spotted, they'll probably be shot on sight. If they succeed, it could very well collapse the South Korean government. All it takes is a single bullet. How did it come to this? Why did North Korea order a state-sanctioned assassination of a foreign head of state? And most importantly, how did the mission go down? This is Trench Diaries and you're about to find out about one of the craziest special operations missions of all time. The late 50s and early 60s were a tumultuous time in international politics. After the Second World War, the globe became bipolar. And not in the medical sense, capitalism and communism were opposed on the world stage and fought for influence over entire nations. This conflict was fought in proxy wars as well as directly. One of these conflicts was the Korean War, also known as the Forgotten War, because it received very little public attention relative to the wars before and after. The Korean War raged from 1950 to 1953 and ended in a stalemate, causing a total of around 4.5 million casualties, with civilians making up about half of this number. Korea had been split up at the end of World War II and been in conflict ever since, with the North becoming the ironically named Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or DPRK, a communist state which was neither democratic nor a republic, and the South becoming the Republic of Korea, or ROK, which was a democracy. The North then invaded on June 25, 1950, in an attempt to unify the country under communist rule. Neither side was able to decisively turn the odds in their favor and in the end the country remained split up along the 30th parallel. And while back then North Korea was pretty much the same as today, South Korea was struggling with internal discord before and after the war. This political instability led to what is known as the April Revolution in, of course, April of 1960. Now, going into this in detail would take way too much time. What's important to know is the fact that this revolution accomplished a lot of things but did not lead to a stable government. And as a result, the South Korean military under the command of General Chang Do-yong, who was army chief of staff at the time, conducted a coup d'etat. They installed the so-called Supreme Council for National Reconstruction and established what was effectively a military dictatorship. After some internal power struggle, a man called Park Chung-hee assumed power and became effective president of South Korea. You might look at this and say, well, what's the big deal? Coups are perfectly normal, but according to North Korean doctrine, this is all going according to plan. You see, communist ideology assumes that capitalism is a stepping stone on the road to a classless society that is communism. At some point, all capitalist societies will see spontaneous revolutions coming from within the people and workers, overthrowing their governments, which are always corrupt and oppressive, of course. In this context, all other communist societies are obliged to support their fellow revolutionaries in their struggles in these foreign lands. And now we come full circle. North Korea at the time had had a stable government. A shitty, corrupt and oppressive government, yes, but stable nonetheless. The idea of a unified Korea did not die with the end of the Korean War, and watching their southerly cousins struggle with establishing a just government only fanned the flames of the revolutionary fire in the North Korean hearts. In fact, it took until 1967 for South Korea to establish a democratically elected government. A government that remained under the leadership of Park Chung-hee, ironically, but he did get elected after all. At this point, North Korea chose to act. Realizing that this democratic government might actually remain stable for once, the Central Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea stuck their heads together and decided that this would not stand. The revolution was on the line after all. And so it came to pass that a clandestine mission was to be planned and executed. A mission that would see Park Chung-hee, the president of South Korea, dead. With him as a strong leader eliminated, surely the people and workers of the South would see the errors of their ways and immediately initiate a communist revolution, which in turn would lead to a reunification of the Korean peninsula. There may or may not also have been a communist insurgency going down into South Korea, just like Vietnam, to nudge things in the right direction, should everything bog down.
but that was a problem to be solved when it arose. You see, they actually chose the screw your optics, I'm going in approach to international relations. And they actually went through with it. North Korean chairman of the Central Committee Kim Il-sung is said to have ordered to prepare to give assistance to the struggle of our South Korean brethren. Although if that is an actual quote is under debate. Anyway, the Korean People's Army, the KPA, in turn established the so-called Unit 124 in July of 1967. This was good time for communist shenanigans of this kind, since retaliation by the United States was found to be highly unlikely, what with them being severely engaged in Vietnam. Unit 124 was made up of 31 officers, who were all handpicked from the KPA for their military accomplishments as well as their political reliability. And then they started training. For months they prepared for this single high-risk, high-reward mission. They trained every skill imaginable. Hand-to-hand -hand fighting, airborne operations, infiltration, exfiltration techniques, camouflage and concealment, and most important, land navigation. Because you know, they were all officers. Anyway, they would also regularly train to traverse rough terrain with 70-pound rucksacks and run at speeds of 8 miles per hour with all their gear on. Which isn't trivial. If you've served, you know. In the final weeks leading up to the mission, they even built a mock-up of the Blue House to train tactics and procedures in. The Blue House being the South Korean president's residence in Seoul. It's called that way because it's blue, in case you're wondering. This hard training regimen regularly resulted in frostbite and lost toes, but the mission was more important. And then, on January the 16th, 1968, they received the green light. They left their garrison at Yonsan and prepared to infiltrate South Korea. The next day at 11 pm, they cut a hole through the fence at the DMZ in the sector that was guarded by the US Army's 2nd Infantry Division. Whoever was on guard duty that night, good job. For one and a half days, they covertly moved southward, crossing the Imjin River in the early hours of January 19. As is common with missions like this, you only move during the night and set up a covert camp during the day where you can rest and take turns sleeping. So they set up camp on Simbong Mountain, which is here, and intended to wait out the day. Notice I said intended. What they did not anticipate was the bane of every special operations mission behind enemy lines since apparently the dawn of time. Goat herders and other juveniles. I mean, just ask the SAS or the SEALs. And so, in the early afternoon of January 19, 1968, the camp of our cheeky communist commandos was stumbled upon purely by chance by a group of four young brothers who were out to cut wood. Immediately recognizing the men camping in the woods as North Korean soldiers, because you know, they were wearing fucking North Korean uniforms, the boys were taken prisoner. Then a debate ensued as to what to do with them. Now, I want to put yourself in the shoes of these men. You've trained a considerable amount of time to conduct what is probably the most important mission of your country's entire history. You've lost a few toes here and there, but it's all good. Your mission's not in trouble yet, as you've not been fully discovered. And after all, these boys, they are just imperialists, right? What would you do? I'll help you out here. I'll give you three options to choose from. One, kill them, bury them in shallow graves and move on. Two, restrain them, gag them, move out and hope that they get found only after some time has passed. Or three hold a spontaneous political lecture on the positive aspects of communism in an attempt to indoctrinate them. Also, let them go afterwards with a stern warning to not go to the police. I'll let you think about this for a few seconds. Correct! They picked number three, I shit you not. The first time I've read about this, my mind immediately created a scene in my head and I like to think that they brought a foldable flip chart or something for precisely this eventuality and then they held the most stereotypically boring lecture about the means of production. Now, having served myself, picturing the situation is absolutely hilarious to me, <laughs> but it gets better because they actually gave them a stern talking to to explicitly not go to the police as soon as they are let go. The boys, of course, went to the police as soon as they were let go. Now, this took the youth some time though, and the commandos immediately broke camp to relocate, which from a tactical perspective was the right move. They rocked at a leisurely pace of just 6 miles per hour and continued southward, not knowing that the authorities had been alerted. They reached Bibong Mountain, which is directly bordering the north districts of Seoul at 7 a.m. at January the 20th. They covered 15 miles in about 12 hours, which is extremely impressive. 
By this time, the South Korean army was on maximum alert and actively searching for the intruders. Three infantry battalions were combing the area between Bobwon, where they were last seen, and the surrounding mountains of Hongjidong, Jongreung, and th this mountain. But since the North Koreans were moving so quickly, they evaded detection. From the hideout on Bibong Mountain, they moved into Seoul in two or three man teams and regrouped at Sengosa Temple. There, they noticed considerably higher security measures due to the authorities knowing of their presence and correctly assuming their intentions. But they would not be denied. They made a decision on the spot and committed to a contingency plan. They changed into South Korean army uniforms, which they of course brought along, and intended to pose as a South Korean army unit, which had just returned from a patrol to find the nasty communist invaders. Being disguised this way, they would simply march the last half mile to the Blue House and then conduct the operation. Yes, half a mile. That's how close they were. And it worked. It actually worked. In the evening hours of January the 21st, 1968, they crossed several checkpoints and barricades, with nobody on the South Korean police or military being the wiser. They made it, until they were just 100 yards away from the Blue House at the final checkpoint. But there, they met the chief of police of the local district, Choi Gyushik. Choi being on top of his game, started questioning the men. Now, this must have been a really awkward and tense conversation. You know the kind, where you pretend to have watched a very important football game or whatever, and you just try and move along with the flow of the conversation, but eventually you reach the point of no return. And so, it happened here. Choi became more and more suspicious, and after having enough of their bullshit, he drew his service pistol and tried to arrest these imposters. But the North Koreans were quicker on the draw, and they shot him as well as one of his deputies. A firefight ensued, but no more people were killed. One of the commandos was taken prisoner, the rest dispersed. With the mission now completely blown, some tried to exfiltrate back across the border, others stayed in the area and hid. In the following days, the South Korean army conducted a vast operation to kill or capture them. And during that operation, the army and police killed 29 of the 31 commandos that were attempting in turn to kill their president. Some commandos hid in civilian buildings, some hid on this mountain again, and in the end only two North Korean commandos survived the mission. One was captured, interrogated for one year by the authorities and then became a South Korean citizen. Apparently, when North Korea found out about this, his family there was arrested and executed. He now lives as a pastor in the south and has a wife and two kids. The other survivor actually made it back to North Korea. He is currently a general in the KPA, he is also vice minister of the Ministry of the People's Armed Forces and a full member of the Central Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea. In total, 59 people died during the mission. 29 North Korean commandos, 26 South Korean soldiers and policemen, as well as four American soldiers at the DMZ who tried to block the commandos from going back across. The international political fallout was rather limited, because shortly after the raid, the USS Pueblo was captured by the North Koreans. Also, shortly after, the Battle of Khaesan and the Tet Offensive in Vietnam shifted public perception away from this comparatively small-scale event. The world chose to look the other way. But South Korea did not. And the response was even crazier than the Blue House raid. But that is a topic for another time. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, let me know and also consider subscribing. I have lots of other videos, mainly about war diaries from World War II. I have accounts from u boat commanders, crew from the Bismarck, as well as a ME-109 pilot. Check them out and I will see you then. Cheers.